Actually, I will invite you to remain standing. In a school year filled with more challenging snow day calls than ever, I don't know why I thought Mother Nature might just give me a break today. No such luck. But in any event, I would like to invite all of you to remain standing during our invocation. It's my pleasure to introduce the Reverend Donna Lee Muse, who will begin our commencement ceremony this afternoon. Reverend Muse is the pastor of First Parish Federated Church here in South Berwick, and she and her church have been long friends and neighbors to Berwick Academy. Her parish was founded in 1702, and therefore enjoys an even longer history than the Academy itself. It's an honor to have her with us today, and I now invite Reverend Muse to the podium. what you have done to bring all of us to this day. Commencement into a new phase of life is just the first step. May your guidance cover each student as they plan and dream of what tomorrow will bring. Amen. Please be seated. Innovation Center wasn't even an idea yet. 
A new public competition for reading poetry has emerged this year. And our math team now marches on with an incredible blend of achievement and pride. Green initiatives have exploded on this campus. I often tell prospective families that Berwick is a place where it's cool to be smart. And your example, class of 2011, allows me to keep a straight face when I make this claim. Perhaps more importantly, you've taken on the daunting task of speaking to the moral soul of our community, working towards our mission's goal of promoting virtue. I witnessed one of you offer an incredibly moving speech on Veterans Day, sharing personal experience with the tragedy of war. A number of you had the courage to allow our community access to the experience of questioning and defining your sexuality, culminating your amazing leadership in our GSA organization. Your willingness to stretch and take risks by creating such conversations has simply made us better. And in the realm of service, you've led us all through your commitment to causes like your talent show and support of Haiti, your service day, your heart and hope partnership with York Hospital. And one of my favorite days of the year was our Earth Day celebration, where you spoke with such conviction that I was simply proud to be a member of the audience, never mind your head of school. Your artistic statements have furthered your deep connection to moral courage. The production of Diary of Anne Frank forced us and our community to think and reflect about the ethical tragedies of history. Your musical production of Beauty and the Beast demonstrated a sophistication and a joy of performance that will not be matched anytime soon. And as usual, I was astonished by the elaborate and inclusive nature of your May Dance recital. Your visual artistry has dazzled us as well. Whether it's been a Vera Wang-like wedding gown made from nothing but paper towels, or haunting human forms encased in packaging tape, you forced us to reconsider beauty. You've continued the Berwick tradition of the coffee house with noteworthy energy, and this year's edition of our outdoor music fest, Woodstock, was as spirited as ever. But I would be remiss without mentioning one particular zenith for your class on a magical senior arts night. The entirely unexpected arrival of the village people <laughs> who showed us all what it would take to be in the Navy. <laughs> and I say, who says swimmers don't know how to dance? <laughs> your class welcomed the arrival of our new turf field with incredible passion and success. An undefeated boys' soccer season within the EIL represents yet another achievement that may not be duplicated. I'll never forget my sense this past fall, watching all of you line the fences on that field with noisemakers and face paint, that something very special has transpired to the spirit of this place through your passion for athletics. One shimmering fall day that remains etched in my mind will be that first varsity soccer game we played on that field a convincing 6-1 defeat of Pingree, announcing to me that a new day had officially arrived. Both the golf team and girls varsity hockey teams posted back-to-back -back EIL championships this year, making a statement of sustained excellence. Another memory will be that overtime victory of those girls ice hockey players at Pingree's rink in that overtime EIL final. Boys basketball went on to the New England Class C tournament and boys lacrosse found their way to the semifinals of their New England tournament. And while these achievements are all stellar, what matters most is that the ethic of sportsmanship you've produced has given me far, far greater pride. <coughs> In a year that I believe has been marked by national scrutiny of our educational system, I believe that the world will be watching all of you in new ways. Certainly, the systemic despair suggested by the documentary Waiting for Superman made me appreciate the Berwick experience on an entirely different level. And similarly, Race to Nowhere's indictment of mindless, zombie-like college preparation treadmills made me grateful that you all have grown up within the culture of the seacoast, where I believe the level of pressure to would be at least slightly more balanced than other regions of the world. However, Shakespeare also reminds us that all the world's a stage. And this year, I was confronted by that role-playing reality when I had a visit from our middle school poetry club. 
after these six students visited my office for 30 minutes or so, Miss Anchor asked them to follow up by describing the experience and spending some time with me. And she warned me that they'd give it to me straight. Clearly, their rather timid demeanor in person cloaked the impassioned counterculturalists that were germinating in my presence. I share with you a few examples of what my office, and sadly, I guess my presence, gave birth to through the eyes of these middle school poets. And I quote, hard, formal, distinguished, perfect, neat. I quickly showed that one to Mrs. Schneider because of the state of my closet at home. <laughs> Another quote, the intimidating but friendly headmaster waits and listens for our words to be heard. And of course, my personal favorite, dark, and mysterious, <laughs> looking as if in a horror film. <laughs> Trust me when I tell you that it does feel that way up there sometimes. <laughs> but this spring, I was also responsible for teaching our eighth grade ethics students about the challenges of socioeconomic class, particularly within our own Berwick community. And I guess I've always been slightly obsessed with the portrayal of private school students in the media. It seems that the world only hears about the suicides or the drugs or the endowment sizes. And whether it's been those timeless phonies of Holden Caulfield's Catcher in the Rye or the current drug-infused cattiness of New York City's prep school scene in Gossip Girl, I don't think the general world's view of us is as rosy as we might hope. Back in my ethics class, I chose to show a few clips from movies I love about New England prep schools. The first, Dead Poets Society, featuring a pre-adolescent Ethan Hawke and master teacher Robin Williams of Carpe Diem fame. The second, school ties, including breakout adolescent performances from stereotypical prep school old boys Chris O'Donnell, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, and the blue-collar Jewish football star Brendan Fraser. Clips from these films began a conversation with the eighth graders about the stereotypes they hear about prep school students. Words like snobby, closed, intense, stressed, self-absorbed, troubled, intense parents, homogenous, in a bubble, out of touch. Now I hope, for those of you over there, those words incite a few of you to take Ethan Hawke's lead, perhaps leap up onto that white folding graduation chair and shout, oh captain, my captain, that's simply not true. But of course, that's not the point, as perception, to some degree, becomes reality once you leave this place. The point is that we now launch you, class of 2011, into a world whose diversity is beyond comprehension. And at the institutions of higher learning in this country, you will confront stereotypes from both peer and professor alike. So I would urge you to accept that it is now your obligation not just to succeed academically at your next school. I have no doubt that you are all well prepared to do that. Rather, you have an obligation to carry on our core values of balance, stretching, integrity, and excellence in such a way that your new college peers are unable to label you in the ways they might hope. Berwick Academy's history of serving as a public school, a boarding school, and now an independent day school comprises a DNA helix that cannot be duplicated in the world of New England private schools. That same uniqueness is now a part of you. As part of my head of school search process that I referenced earlier, I was asked to think deeply about Dan Pink's insightful book, A Whole New Mind, Why Right Brainers Will Rule the World. And I'm quite sure Mr. Kamen might have a few thoughts to share on why creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship are so essential to your futures. But Mr. Pink has published a new book this year entitled Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. And his conclusion is that traditional extrinsic concepts of incentivizing performance through things like salary bonuses pale in their effectiveness to the intrinsic motivating forces of things like autonomy, mastery, and purpose. He concludes by expressing his thesis this way. We know that human beings are not merely smaller, slower, better smelling horses galloping after the day's carrot. We know, if we've spent time with young children or remember ourselves at our best, that we're not destined to be passive or compliant. We're designed to be active and engaged. And we know that the richest experiences in our lives 
aren't when we're clamoring for validation from others, but when we're listening to our own voice, doing something that matters, doing it well, and doing it in the service of a cause larger than ourselves. And how do I know that these graduates today know these words to be true? So I will close with what I must consider to be my favorite moment of your senior year. Although I will say last night's baccalaureate ceremony certainly gave it a run for its money. It's a fleeting snapshot, clearly not known nor remembered by many, but one that was captured by my cell phone in September. It's a picture from our 10th day assembly back in the fall of a member of your class and one particular student from our third grade. And as our graduates know, we offered a unique twist to our K-12 gatherings this year, empowering our youngest lower school students to sit with each of you. And as I listened to Danny McKinnon deliver one of the more moving musical performances during my time at VA, my gaze casually drifted to the crowd, and I recount the image for you here. A member of the class of 2011 sits in the front of this same gymnasium, right over there, intently watching Danny's performance. He happens to be someone that I know has struggled with the academic challenges of Berwick. And although a gifted athlete, his personality is relatively quiet and reserved, at least in our hallways. And perhaps he's someone that a few teachers have wondered as to whether or not he was a right fit for this place. But between his legs on this wooden floor sits another Berwick Academy boy. Unbeknownst to the senior this third grader has experienced similar challenges in our lower school, perhaps raising the same types of questions as to whether or not he was a mission-appropriate student. But through the unifying catalyst of Danny's voice, I look through that viewpoint and capture this third grader lying back on the senior hockey player's chest, quite literally nuzzling into the warmth of his embrace. And both senior and third grader are intently focused on that performance, connected physically and emotionally to a cause that is quite clearly greater than themselves. The class of 2011, I speak on behalf of Berwick Academy's faculty and staff as I wish you well. Your stories, your growth, and your compassion are now permanently embedded in the walls and hearts of this place that you must now leave.
next, we will have our salutatory address if he can make it up here. <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce our salutatorian to you this morning. This young man's story is one that should warm our collective hearts. At his recent cum laude presentation, I heard him describe the intellectual light bulb that went on for him at the close of his freshman year. He began his talk by admitting that he'd been allowing himself to underachieve for a certain period of time. Quite literally, he decided to will himself to the very top of his class in terms of his academic work, completing 10 honors in AP courses in his final three years and amassing a staggering GPA of 95.29. Winner, <laughs> Winner of the History Recognition Award and the Bausch and Long Award as a junior, he's been recognized for his steady pursuit of excellence throughout his high school career. As a commended scholar in the SAT National Merit Program, no one was surprised when Tufts University gobbled him up that day. That nobody was surprised Tufts gobbled him up so that they too would have a chance to benefit from his latent intellectual energy. Outside of the classroom, he tends to enrich this place with club activity that appeal to his intellectual curiosity. He's been a key, key member of our robotics team, a member of the Foreign Film Club, the Chess Club, and the Philosophy Club. He's made notable appearances in the drama productions of The Man Who Came to Dinner and Arms and the Man. And athletically, he's been an important contributor to our cross country and tennis teams. But all of these achievements aside, it's his unique personality and charisma that I believe sets him apart as a special human being. There's something so genuine and likable about this young man that I'm simply proud to call him one of our students. I often tell prospective families that Berwick is a place that takes great pride in working with students who might be slightly outside of the box. And when I look at the class of 2011 today, I would argue that their collective box has shifted to accommodate Mr. Patino. The box is stronger and more intricately woven as a result of that enhancement, and it's through his extraordinary work ethic and humble presence, it simply couldn't have happened any other way. So join me in welcoming the salutatorian for the class of 2011, Mr. Daniel Patino. Cross-country team. 
I thought it would be fun and easy. <laughs> now, I thought the first day, I thought the practice, you just go to practice, maybe run a few laps, play a few fun running games, <laughs> push ups, and then go home. <laughs> now, I'll tell you the truth, this was absolutely totally wrong. <laughs> and on my first day of practice, the team ran a relatively easy four mile loop in downtown South Berlin. And it was exquisitely painful. <laughs> I don't know how I made it back to campus. But as I was struggling over the final two miles, I remember thinking, cross country is not for me. I'm not built for this. Other people on this team, they must be able to do these kinds of runs because they were born with cross country type bodies. <laughs> I should quit. But I did go to practice the next day. And I began to realize that my teammates were able to succeed in running these miles, not because they were born with cross-country bodies, but because they had worked hard and put in effort through many years and many practices. And I realized that I could do the same thing. And so I persevered and I ran what Mr. Davey told me to run, and I eventually became a competent runner. Now, the second story, has to do with our junior trip. Um, as soon as we finished our finals in our junior year, our class went into, onto a wilderness trip. And the first day of the trip, we went to a ropes course. Now, I absolutely hate ropes courses. <laughs> and this particular one was more unpleasant than usual for me. <laughs> because there was a certain structure I had never seen on any previous ropes course. Now what it was, I'm sure my classmates will know what I'm talking about. What it was was a 40 foot tall structure made out of two poles, about 15 feet from each other. In between were uh, horizontal poles forming rungs, as in the ladder, and the poles were hanging there by ropes. The, the rungs were, so that when you were on one, it swung back and forth. And the goal was to climb to the top of this 40 foot tall ladder, hoisting yourself up from pole to pole, and they're about six feet from each other. So you had to pull your whole body up. And we did this with the partner. Um, Owen was my partner that day. And I remember, it took us about 20 minutes to get halfway up. And most other teams had finished in about 10 minutes. We were halfway up, and I was not having fun. <laughs> I said to Owen, you know, I think we've gone far enough, we should quit now. <laughs> Owen said, no, we've been, we've been making good, steady progress. We just have to keep working, we'll make it to the top. And so we did. And eventually, 20 minutes later, we did make it to the top. Now, though it took us longer than the rest of the people, we did make it, and it felt great. And that's what counts. So, to sum up, I know that there are countless other stories similar to this that my classmates could tell me today. It does not matter it's in the classroom or on the baseball diamond or in the art studio or on the tennis court, the hockey rink, or on the stage. What matters most, I believe, is the individual effort we put into our work. Here at Burke, we have been lucky and that the road to success is often made easier due to the guidance of our teachers and our coaches. But we are leaving Burwick. We must realize it will not always be this way. In college and beyond, I believe that the values that drove Thomas Edison to construct 100 prototypes of his light bulb prior to making the one that actually worked, these values would be more important and vital than ever. And so I want to thank my family and my classmates for teaching me all that I know today about effort and hard work.
<laughs> At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce the class advisors for our graduates. At Berwick, the class advisor role engenders a special bond between two adults and the class as a whole as they serve as the logistical and spiritual leaders for the group as they make their way through the four years of upper school program. And clearly that responsibility doesn't end until this ceremony is over. <laughs> Ted Sherbon is an upper school English teacher who connects with our students through his love of prose as well as his passion for music and sport. The example of his work ethic is extraordinary and his passion for these kids is second to none. Brad Fletcher is an upper school history teacher who's equally omnipresent in the life of our students through his innovative teaching, his presence in our theater, our gymnasium, his oversight of senior projects, and his delivery of a legendary senior trivia experience at my house this past week. Beyond their deep friendship and their professional respect for one another, these two clearly share a deep love for the class of 2011. I've asked these two fine faculty members to come to the stage to announce the extraordinary results of our senior gift campaign this year. Please welcome Ted Sherman and Brad Fletcher. Generosity and giving enable this school to function in ways beyond most of our understanding. And this class has given back to us in so many ways. Back in the early spring, the seniors were asked to identify the target area for their class fund and chose campus preservation. They then went on to contribute to this fund with 100% participation, again demonstrating their generosity and group identity. It is our pleasure to announce that the combined contributions of the students and their families uh, to the class of 2011 Endowment Fund for Campus Preservation amounts to $40,588. Alex Audi, Marla Cates, Sue Ann Lachance, Chris Nichols, and Karen Wittet for leading this effort. faculty awards which are traditionally awarded at commencement and certainly one of my favorite moments in this ceremony. And we start with the Jimmy Dean Award. The Jimmy Dean Award is named in honor of long-term faculty member Jimmy Dean and the award recognizes a faculty or staff member who lives his or her commitment to the academy each day. These qualities reflect the optimism and joy that is exuded by the beloved Jimmy Dean even to this day. Faculty and staff members are nominated and chosen by the administration. Four summers ago, 
Patrick Bassett, the head of the National Association of Independent Schools, gave yours truly one singular piece of advice when I was a member of the New Heads Institute in 2007. And it was brilliant in its simplicity. Hire happy people. <laughs> he went on to say that if we did not find a way to hire happy people, we would get what we deserved as heads of school. And when the administration thinks each year about the Jimmy Dean Award, I always believe one of the most important criteria is who is it this year that we can truly say we look forward to seeing every single day? Someone whose very presence and attitude makes us all collectively feel that we're in the right place. And while Mr. Bassett might question much of what I've accomplished here so far, I think he'd agree that I got his hiring mantra right when it comes to our honoree today. Our recipient this year is not only a happy person, but I believe her positive outlook is so contagious that she makes our community stronger. Beyond the fact that she's gifted in her craft, passionate about her students, knowledgeable in her discipline, and omnipresent on this campus, it's her optimism that sets her apart. She always seems to be a part of solutions on this campus. She's the first one to say, well, we can do that. Her energy and vision has springboarded Berwick's conversation about innovation to an entirely new level. And along with her colleagues, I believe she's transformed the atmosphere of Jackson Library from traditional and silent to a place that is productive, joyous, and fun. Beyond all of the creative book clubs and cookie events, I believe this boils down to the fact that the students simply want to be in her presence. She makes them feel good about themselves. And I can speak to all of you honestly when I say that this has been true in my case as well. And although I hope this award will be one that she will cherish, I don't believe she could receive a more important honor than the one she received this fall from the class of 2011 when she was elected to be their convocation speaker. And not surprisingly, she reminded our graduates at the start of this year that choosing to see the positives in the world has extraordinary potential to make not only our communities better, but this choice will ultimately feed our souls as well. My secret plea is that today we forge a moment when the roles will temporarily be reversed. It's now our turn to nourish her soul by saying thank you. For someone who seems to continue to give so much of herself to our students and faculty, I take great pride in having a small chance to offer her something in return today. And as I look into the audience, I'm pleased to see that she's stepped away from the Kindles of Kafta's Corner to be with her beloved class of 2011. And so for her work as an extraordinary librarian, but even more importantly, as an extraordinary human being, Please join me in saying congratulations to our 2011 Jimmy Dean Award winner, Darcy Cockle. organization, work ethic, and sheer will. 
And I will tell you, when I came to Berwick four years ago, there was a certain amount of conversation about our need to develop a niche or desire to have a program that would truly differentiate us. And four years later, I can say with great confidence that this program has in fact been here for quite some time. There are a few teachers at Berwick who have the ability to touch as many as this person does. Her role spans the K-12 spectrum, but also inspires the lives of parents and faculty members as well. Perhaps on rehearsal weekends, she inspires the parents just a bit too deeply with her infamous eight-hour marathons. However, we've all come to expect nothing short of her visionary alchemy when we take our seats for one of our Berwick Academy dance programs. Who would have thought that Little Berwick Academy in the seacoast of Maine would have almost a third of its students involved in its dance academy? Separate from the students here who are truly exceptional at dance, I believe that her program has been viewed so strongly that parents know that being a part of Berwick Academy, dance is simply essential, whether you are male or female. And beyond the public judgment that's always associated with performance, I love that she finds ways to empower her students. Rather than merely rely on her own gifts, she constantly pushes her students to create and choreograph new ideas. When I leave her shows, I inevitably crave the audio soundtracks that she's strung together. My daughter witnessed her first Berwick Academy dance show this spring, and for someone who's known for bouncing around in her seat a little bit, once the dancers arrived, she was spellbound, and so was I. And of course, the beauty of her artistry tends to diminish the other skills. As our technical theater expert, she makes every event run smoothly. She also happens to have an incredible business mind, and we often forget her dance academy truly functions like a school within our school, filled with tuition billing, employee management, and customer service. As you might imagine, I empathize with that plight. Creative, talented, innovative, and committed, hers is a presence on this hilltop that I believe changes, challenges our adults and young people to stretch outside of their comfort zones. Her role combines intellectual prowess, athletic skill, and artistic grace unlike any other. And while she'll be disappointed to learn that I will not be pumping any raucous hip-hop through the speakers today as she approaches, she can rest assured that she will not be required to demonstrate her many skills on this stage while adorned in her regal academic garb. I am, however, going to ask her to join me at the podium so we can celebrate her work. So please join me in saying congratulations to our 2011 Dorothy Green Teacher of the Year Award winner, Sasha Malone. Perhaps his most famous invention 
has been the Segway human transporter, which we certainly all now see in major urban areas worldwide. Mr. Kamen harbors a distinct passion for education and young people as well, as he founded FIRST, an organization dedicated to motivating the next generation to understand, use, and enjoy science and technology. Berwick Academy's robotics team now competes in this first robotics competition, which combines critical thinking, problem solving, teamwork, and engineering in a way that I believe truly makes science cool. Mr. Kamen's received numerous awards and accolades, including the Heinz Award in Technology, the Economy and Employment in 1998, the National Medal of Technology from President Clinton in 2000, the Lemelson MIT Prize in 2002 for Invention and Innovation, the United Nations Association of the USA Global Humanitarian Action Award in 2006, the American Society Manufacturer Engineers Medal in 2007, the Lego Prize in 2008, and in 2009, the Committee for Economic Policy, Development Public Policy Award, as well as honorary degrees from more than 25 colleges and universities. And Dean was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in May of 2005. I would like to thank Lucas and Robin Merrill, parents of graduate Sophie Merrill, for making it possible for Dean to be at Berwick on this special occasion. I know the Caymans and the Merrills share a deep friendship and a shared passion for innovation. And I wanted to acknowledge their personal connection to this event today. Berwick Academy is incredibly grateful that Mr. Cayman was able to be here, as he is clearly someone who fields hundreds of such requests with great regularity. Our graduates are in for a wonderful memory today on account of his presence. Please join me in welcoming our 2011 commencement speaker, Mr. Dean Kane. The sad truth is, <clears throat> I owe it to Lucas because I always prevail upon him come and give support to first and year after year. He does. So even though I'm terrified to speak to high school students, I had no choice but to really do this. <laughs> On the way in, I was so terrified I decided I should do the speech in Latin. <laughs> but two things immediately occurred to me. One is they probably know Latin, <laughs> and I don't. <laughs> is make an observation to all of you. Today, really, the focus has nothing to do with you. You are the sideshow. <laughs> you probably noticed this already, but parents have a peculiar thrill that they start out with and never give up from the time you were little kids. First birthday, they put you in silly hats and costumes. Get into kindergarten, hats and costumes. Party after party, Halloween, holidays. They never tire of putting you in silly outfits. <laughs> I'm asked the question by a servant, state what I'd like. 
My mother insists on modifying the order to what she knows I like. <laughs> I, I can develop products. I have 400 brilliant engineers here. I have companies around buy and sell businesses, but I still cannot order my own. <laughs> so get used to it. It will not change. <laughs> The reason I think actually that's important for you to recognize that perspective is that though they all mean well, they will continue to give you advice. And the advice is always unintentional, I think, on their part, but it's always advice which will keep you out of harm's way, keep you from doing risky things. Yeah. They will continue to try to deliver to you things that you, quote, deserve things that they want you to have. It's not only well-intentioned, these are the people that probably care more about you than anybody you'll ever get to know. But life isn't about avoiding all risks, and life isn't about deserving things or getting things given to you and being made easy. In fact, Everything I've ever done in life that turned out to be worthwhile was the result of taking a risk that most people thought I shouldn't do, particularly parents. I spent the best five years of my life as a freshman. <laughs> because I went off to college and I saw what a rich environment that was. There were so many smart professors and there was so much going on and I realized I could learn lots of stuff at the intersection of math and physics. But the intersection isn't where the courses are, it isn't where the... Basically, I stopped going to class, didn't take the test, so after a number of years, I was still a freshman. But I made a trade. I had to make a rational trade-off between optimizing my education, learning as much as I could, as fast as I could, working hard at it, versus doing the prescribed stuff in which I would be guided and protected and do things the way it was supposed to be done. I do not regret what I did. For a little while in there when I, quote, dropped out, my mother wasn't talking to me much. And I understand why. Her intentions were great. But it's your life, and the world changes so that every new generation lives in a very different environment than the people that are there to protect you and give you advice about the world as they see it and as it was when they grew up. For instance, at almost all of the ceremonies like this I've gone to, inevitably somebody stands up. I was very glad that that didn't happen here. It would have been embarrassing to have but they'll typically give up and with some great enthusiasm explain, you worked hard, now is your time. Go out and conquer the world. The world is very different than it was even when I was your age. But one thing I can assure you, the world doesn't need conquering. The world is kind of on life support. Whether it's you care about the environment and the polar caps are melting, care about the global inability of government institutions to be civil with each other and with their own people. Whether you look at the looming probability that we will not be able to make health care available in a reasonable way. You know, pick the big problem du jour. None of those situations need conquering. And the idea that once you've got an education, you've worked so hard, you're entitled, I think is a very dangerous, broken message. If you think you've worked hard, there are 6.3 billion people out there right now. A couple of billion of them are essentially your contemporaries. Four of the six billion people get up every day they work hard looking for water, or food, or security, or safety. That's hard work. 
I hope what you've done here in your whole life is the hardest fun you could ever have. And that business of back and forth so hard you're now entitled, I think there's such a tiny percentage of the people in the world that have been given the most powerful tools in the world, education, that they have way more than an entitlement, they have a burden and a responsibility to use that education to fix the world. The four billion people that don't have water and food and education and tools are unlikely to be able to do that. If you want to take the perspective that the hard work is entitling you to something, I would then say you want to use your education as a weapon and not a tool, a way to pull things out of the world and not grow it and make it bigger and better for everybody. We've seen a generation of that whether it's the world comms or the Enrons or the AIGs or the collapses, they didn't happen by themselves. They happened because very sophisticated, very educated people use that education to game systems and to try to get something for themselves at the expense of others. I don't think education should be used for that. It's unsustainable. It's inappropriate. And Sadly, it's not your fault, but you're now living in a world that's paying the consequences of that. It has to change. And your parents and I are not going to be the ones that change it. Frankly, we're the ones that handed it to you. Now, I don't feel particularly guilty about that <laughs> because you've also been handed lots of other things that we didn't have on the upside of that ledger. Every one of you has got a cell phone on you that has more memory in it than existed in all the computers in the world the year I was born. All of you are standing on the shoulders of giants in terms of your baseline education. You're starting where all of humanity left off. That's not so bad if you use it properly. So I, I am not going to stand here and give you the rah-rah speech. And if you think, again, that you've worked hard, you should really feel quite special and lucky that you had that opportunity. And for those of you that think, well, education is expensive, or going on to college is expensive, if you think that's expensive, you should try the cost of ignorance. Or you should imagine going through life without an education. So, as I said, your parents aren't going to grow up. They're not going to change. Nor are your good friends that all mean well. That will all continue to try to tell you what you want to hear. Tell you how to take the safe road. Your parents, I think, well-meaning, your comrades, your professors. You know, it's pretty obvious that the safest place for a ship is in the harbor. It just doesn't do any good there. I think, as you go through the next four years, the next lump of education, it will be made even more intense to you that you're work, working hard and it's costing you time and money and it will be easy to fall into a mode where you therefore think you're entitled. And there will be ways that you can do things that will create personal gain with minimal personal risk. I would strongly urge you to not be lulled into any of that. I wouldn't take inappropriate risks. I wouldn't be foolhardy. I wouldn't take risks that can endanger you or the people you care about. But just remember where everybody else is coming from. 
it's going to be your world, you're going to have to make it, and you're going to have to live with the consequences of it. I was told, by, by every time I've been asked to speak to a bunch of people at a university, typically not at a high school, it all boils down to the same thing. Okay, you know, give them some advice on how to succeed. And I'm always thinking, geez, they had it for their whole life. The university's had it for four years, we took a few hundred thousand bucks from them. I get it for 10 minutes and I'm supposed to tell them how to succeed. <laughs> but since I don't want to disappoint the people that asked me to do this, or, or Lucas, I have over time come up with a short list of the hundred things you need to do. <laughs> Well, as I said, I think this day is mostly about your parents. I'll give you the list of a hundred things, but I know you want to be out here by tomorrow, so I'll do it fast. <laughs> Number one, think of something really important to you that when you look back over your life, you'll say, I did that. That's not easy to do. That's the one place, by the way, that geezers have some advantages over you. They sort of know what's important. They learned it the hard way. A lot of what you think is important today, tickets to that concert or that new Blackberry, things that you think are important in the grand scheme of things probably are. But figure out something that's really important. And by the way, in every other way, you do have advantages over that. Because if you can think of something important, you have more time than we do. You're starting out with a better education. You can take bigger risks, despite what they say, because you've got way less to lose. But think of something really important to do, and decide you're going to do it. Number two, don't give up. Now, by the way, as you get to number two, and you decide you're not going to give up, when everybody starts explaining to you, that's risky, that's crazy, nobody's ever done that before, that's really hard, well-meaning people will try to convince you not to do it. That's a good sign. That means you've actually found something important. If it's obvious, if people think that's okay, it's probably not gonna matter much whether you succeed or not. Learn how to fail with some class and some courage. Because as I said, if you try to do something that nobody's done before, it's important, <clears throat> it's probably hard, and you'll probably fail, and fail again, and fail again. That's okay, you'll learn from it. I can assure you that failure is part of everything important, because all the important stuff that's already been done has been done because it was easier than what you have to do. It's easy stuff that's already been done. The wheel, fire, movable time. You know, we've had a few thousand years where the easy stuff's done. So you're going to pick something that they probably don't even understand. And you'll work hard at it, and having a lot of people discourage you, discourage you all the time, is just part of getting the work thing done. But don't worry, once you succeed at it, they'll all remind you that they were with you all along on this <laughs> But if you pick that really hard thing, that's number one. And you never give up, unless, Somebody comes along and shows you they had a better solution and the problem solved. Or maybe you finally figure out the second law of thermodynamics says that'll never work. I mean, the laws of nature, trust those. The good judgment of friends, not so much. So as long as it remains an important problem and it's unsolved and you believe in it, keep working at it. Just keep working at it. That's number two.
is the best news of all. The other 98 pieces of advice don't matter. So I'm done. <laughs>
James Mitchell Collins. Averill Shazi June Daly.
Grace Jacobs. Sydney Rose Cates. Lucy Lathrop Kelly. Owen Michael Labrie. Jordan Haley Lachance. William Frederick Leach. <laughs> Alexandra Eve Lazama. Catherine Francis McFarland. <laughs> Daniel Stephen McKinnon. Jenna Margo Maddock. <laughs> Treston Pierre Tennyson Mattel. Nisha Mata. <laughs> Michael McGuigan. Sophia Ruth Merrow. <laughs> Marisa Madeline Miles.
Alexis Mosquero.
Boy Walters. Jenna has garnered a GPA of 97. <laughs> Along the way, she's achieved a number of perfect scores on her SAT tests, earning her recognition as a National Merit Semifinalist as well as a Presidential Scholar nominee. She's placed first in the state of Maine on the French language exams all of her four years, She's won multiple departmental awards, the Princeton Book Award, and a number of prior Cogswell Awards for maintaining the top GPA in her class. But what may surprise our audience even more is to begin to comprehend the depth and breadth of her other talents. As one of the strongest athletes in our upper school, she's shined as an extremely formidable member of our softball team in recent years. People are perhaps more aware of her dominance on our cross-country team and throughout New England in this sport. She's been a feared EIL and NEPSAC competitor, winning many races during her time here. And these results have led to her being named multiple times to EIL and New England all-star status in this sport. However, it's her greatest athletic talent, 
of which we are least aware in this community that is most special, Nordic skiing. And while juggling her extraordinary academic load at Berwick, Jenna has competed at a national level in her sport of greatest personal passion, one that she will continue to pursue at the collegiate level next year. And of course, Jenna's musical talents at Berwick Academy are legendary as well. As a flautist, she's become both technically astute and artistically graceful. And all of this has left us wondering what she cannot do. And I'm quick to respond by saying this, nothing. Her intellectual curiosity is one that goes far beyond aspiring towards academic achievement. She simply desires to know how the world works, all of it. This is someone who we will hear from again on this hilltop, and her breadth of talent and knowledge has already brought great acclaim to this institution. Perhaps the only area where my cognitive functioning might begin to approach Jenna's is in our mutual decision to attend small colleges in western Massachusetts. Having just returned from my own Amherst College reunion recently, I humbly tip my cap to my omnipresent nemesis, Williams, for successfully matriculating Berwick Academy's finest through their early decision process. They cannot possibly know the kind of intellect they will be welcoming to their extraordinary campus this fall. This young woman has been an academic inspiration to us all, and it's my pleasure to announce our valedictorian and Cogswell Award winner, Ms. Jenna Mack. Our class advisor, Mr. Sherbon, started off the year by telling the senior class to be bad. This initially caused some consternation. Mr. Smith's, Mr. Schneider's, and Mr. Sleeva's faces were equal parts fear, anxiety, and confusion, with a dash of, oh no you didn't. <laughs> However, as Mr. Sherbon went on to explain, he wanted the seniors not to rebel causelessly, but to challenge the status quo. So now it is I who has, must ask the faith of both the teachers and the parents as I am going to tell my class not to go get a degree. This probably seems hypocritical coming from me, so let me clarify. I do not mean to speak against edit, getting an education, but for the past four years, we have been more or less held to an eight to five schedule, whether F, G, C, A, B, D, E or E, F, G, A, B, C, D, or deck fab, or whatever crazy mnemonic devices we made up to keep track of the order. Our course selection has been fairly limited, and we have needed to keep a balance of subjects in order to be well-rounded and get into college. But now, because we have worked hard to get here, we have the ability to choose what we want to do, and we have a reasonable foundation in the major academic disciplines and sports. For basically the first time, we have the option to pursue something of our choice, and we have at least a starting point for knowing what we do or do not like. And this is why I'm telling, I am telling you not to just get a degree in something and come out the other end of college with a fancy piece of paper, some letters after your name, and no real interest in what you studied. Take advantage of the freedom that we have been given. If you know what you want to study, take those courses. If you have no idea, use these years to explore. Take all of the random classes that sound interesting, invent, invest time and effort into them, and see whether you want to continue them or not. If you have no interest in going to classes whatsoever and getting a traditional degree, then don't go to college. It would be a waste of time and resources to merely follow the plan that others have set out for you if you don't actually care about what you're doing at all. I am lucky. I like learning all the subjects. I actually enjoy differential equations, orbital bonding theory, and finding pairs of oxymoronic adjectives in The Great Gatsby. I like gears, I like circuit boards, and I like taking things apart to see why and how they work. I want to go to college because I want to learn more and take more classes and learn more languages. It's something I could spend a lifetime doing, 
So, my parents have informed me that I only have four years on their docket. <laughs> this makes the decision easy for me. I want to go to college. My parents want me out of the house. So therefore, I'm going to go to a liberal arts college next year, where I can take many different types of classes, as well as ski. What I want to do and what my parents expect me to do are the same. I know that some, and probably most of you, do not share this irrational fascination with French syntax, or trying to figure out exactly what Confucius meant when he said, a gentleman is not a pot. For you, this could be harder, especially if you've been already told that you are going to become a doctor or a lawyer or some other career. Don't put off doing what you want to do, though. Don't think, I just need to get through freshman year, or college, or grad school, before I have free time to start. Something will always come up. Now is the best time. We have few obligations, and we have the whole of our lives in front of us. So if you want to travel to Southeast Asia, go do it. If you want to play hockey or soccer, go do it. The worst outcome is that you don't make it and have to spend some more time living with your parents. <laughs> and well, I know that neither you nor they particularly want that to happen, the risk is worth it. If you truly love what you're pursuing, then all that time you have spent will not have been wasted. I spent hours freezing off my extremities in the pitch black for cross-country ski training during the winter. But I would not trade that for the world. Because more than racing, more than talking to other racers, I love to ski. And at the end of the day, I am always much happier after being on snow. I've gone to this school for 13 years. There are some of you I've known for that whole length. Some of you I just met this year, and most of you are somewhere in between. I know some people better than others, but one of the lessons that this class has taught me is how to appreciate everyone's individual talent, especially those that cannot be measured by the grade one average. As a class, I think we've been able to bring out the best in each other, and that best is pretty spectacular. I want to see what you guys can do, and I know that all of you have an equal or better chance of succeeding as I do. Yes, I am the one at this stage making the speech. But being high school valedictorian is rather irrelevant if you're trying to become a musician. I'm not saying that this isn't going to be hard. But the fact is, we're graduating from Berwick. And that means we know how to dig our heels in and work. I can't promise that I'm going to amount to anything. But I am going to promise to think about what I'm doing and to care about what I'm doing. And I promise to help any of you to the best of my ability with whatever you're doing. Over the past few days, so many members of our class have stood up and said that we gave them the courage to perform and to put themselves out there. We are separating next year and won't be seeing each other every morning in assembly. But I think that the best gift we can give when we leave is the knowledge that wherever anyone will be, the rest of us are only a phone call or a Facebook message away. And our support will not weaken with the distance. It's this kind of community that has brought us this far and will make our future ambition possible. We've had 18 years to dream. Let's start living on. Before we conclude with our benediction and recessional, I'd like to remind our graduates and their guests that there will be refreshments available in the commons across the way immediately following these exercises. But I also wanted to take a moment to note a final Berwick Academy tradition. After the benediction, our faculty will march first, and they will form a two-sided tunnel in the entrance to the Blue Gym to applaud the entering graduates. And the graduates will in turn form their own receiving line in the Blue Gym once they pass through this tunnel. Berwick faculty members then proceed through that senior speaks receiving line to say a final word of personal and intimate 
congratulations. We ask the audience please respect this cherished tradition and then we invite all who are interested to proceed through that same receiving line as well. We'll conclude by gathering as a community at the Commons. Thank you. At this point, I would like to invite you all to rise for our final benediction, which will be presented by Reverend Hughes. Friends, you will remember well that you have been given much gifts, privilege, and hope. But it is not completely of your own doing, as you have so well stated here today. No one gets through this life on their own. And so I bless you for the journey ahead. And please never forget to be thankful for what God has done.